Hi guys, welcome to my channel. I've been waiting to release this video for a couple days now. And it will basically give you guys a little insight into me and my babe's time while being incarcerated. With that being said, my name is Deidre. I'm 33 years old. I'm the oldest of three siblings. I have a 32-year-old brother who was murdered when he was 17, and I have a 16-year-old sister, and I spent three years in prison. My name is Neek. I'm the oldest out of four. Um, I spent 12 years in prison, and I'm from Sacramento, California. So basically, first question will be, how was the first day being incarcerated in um, a prison facility? So, with that being said, I arrived to CCWF, Central California Women's Facility. In case you guys don't know, that's Chowchilla in Central California. And when I tell you, I stepped onto a yard, which is reception. They had three um, units that you can go to. I stepped on reception with the Moomoo on, in case you guys don't know what that is. That's basically the gown they give you when you go to the hospital. So, when I say... I stepped in prison with absolutely nothing. I started from the bottom, now we here, because I had absolutely nothing. Not even a nickel or a penny to my name. None of my clothes, none of my shoes. Everything was um, given to me by the prison itself. When I say that, it was the worst possible day you could imagine. It was June 23rd, 2017 approximately seven days from my 29th birthday. It was very, very, very hot, very hot when I arrived and in prison. Um, I got assigned to a unit. I walked into my unit and surrounded by seven females, eight including myself that I had no idea who they were, their background, where they came from, completely a new environment for me. It was probably one of the worst days of my life. Okay, so me going back to my first time, how I felt was the experience for me basically was just, I was 18 years old and I'm not even gonna lie. I wasn't scared of people or nothing, but I was scared of the experience on how to just learn how to survive, what I'm gonna do. And it was a bunch of emotions going through my head. You feel me? And all I can remember is sitting inside the unit and them dividing everybody between who was from Sacramento or the Bay Area and who was from LA. Because back then, that's who you stick with. Everybody from LA stick with each other and everybody from Sacramento or the Bay Area stick with each other. So from my experience, I kind of just a solo type of person. So I just want to stick with myself. You feel me? I didn't want to be clicked up with this person or that person. So. That was the experience for me first coming in. Thank you, babe. Second question would be how we had to adapt while being in prison. I would say for me, when I first knew that I was going to prison, uh, I wanted to be a part of the hype, basically get tattoos and just do everything that I had no business doing inside of prison. Because at first, I took it as maybe a stripe or a badge of honor because I was going to prison. But when I actually got there, I found out that I didn't want to do any of the things that I said I was going to do because there's a lot of things going on in prison that you guys may not never know. And it's a lot of detail and a lot of action and a lot of things that people will never know unless they experience it firsthand. So I had to adapt basically by just being myself staying out the way and focusing on who I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. Because the moment you get involved in things that you have no business getting involved in is when you're basically asking for trouble. So the moment I stepped onto a yard, the reception facility, and you're there for three months before you go to the main yards where everybody is and all the action is going down, I basically figured out at that point that I needed to figure out who Deidre was. And that means minus getting in all the action and being in everything that had to go had to go on inside of there is it was best for me to just 
figure out who I was because where I wanted to be is not there. How I basically feel is I kind of felt like lost and depressed. You feel me? Going over there and not knowing nobody and just having yourself and not a phone to call, nobody to talk to. You just you by yourself and you realizing, you feel me, the mistakes you've done in life and how everybody you thought you knew or care about you or your friends, family members or whatever. Now this is this time where you really by yourself. And what are you going to do? So by then, I really didn't know. You feel me? I didn't know myself. I didn't know how I feel. I was just looking at this place like, you feel me? I don't want to be here. Thank you, baby. So the third question would be all the feelings that I felt while being incarcerated. And I felt loneliness. I felt depressed. I felt sadness. I felt anxious. I felt a little bit worried as in what's going to happen. I constantly looked out the windows trying to figure out why I'm here, why I'm not at home, why I'm not around the people I love, why I'm not around things that are familiar to me. I'm somewhere where I can't see past the window. And when you look out the window, all you see is nothing but dirt and other inmates. It probably had to be one of the most... Um, scariest mental things in my life just based on the fact that everything that's new or the the uncomfortable is is kind of scary and so I felt everything that I could possibly feel you can't call your family you can't call your friends I mean well you can but nine times out of ten you're there alone with people you don't know and it's a ton of feelings that you feel every day when you wake up. You go to sleep and you wake up. You have dreams about all the old things you used to do only to wake up and realize that you're still an inmate and you're surrounded with people that you don't know and you're not getting out right now. So all those things that you remember and dream about and all the memories are basically suppressed into a wide range of feelings because you're not going home. So you're gonna have to figure it out and deal with these feelings on your own. Um, the emotion I felt was, I'm not even gonna lie to y'all. I was angry, I was mad, you feel me? And I was on the hype of forget everybody. You feel me, I don't like nobody. I don't want to talk to nobody. And if somebody have an issue, you feel me? I'm not scared by far. You feel me? But I realized my deeper emotion was, you feel me? I was really just, you feel me, depressed and not knowing what the heck to do. So that turned into just anger of not knowing. You feel me? And going on basically protection mode. I don't even want to think about nothing else. So that's just what type of emotions I was having. Thank you. The fourth question would be the most scariest thing I seen while being incarcerated. Of course, it's a lot of things going on in the free world. Scary things, people getting murdered, fights, and all those type of things. But when you're basically in your own lane going to work and going home, you don't tend to see those things. But while being incarcerated, all those things are in front of you. And it's basically based off of you, what you're going to do or how you're going to feel or the actions you're going to take. So one of the worst things I've seen in prison probably would be the fact that if the inmates want to come in your room and beat you up, that's exactly what's going to happen. And you think because you're incarcerated that the police are going to come and break up the fight. That is not what is going to happen. They're going to beat you up, and they're going to beat you up bad. And they wish that you would tell, because that's not the, the best solution that you should do. And the police are not going to save you. So my best advice for that particular situation would be to mind your own business and stay in your own lane. Because when I say they really do beat people up in your room for like a whole five to ten minutes, when they come out of there, they really be beat up like black eyes swollen to a T, can barely even see. And the police never came in and stopped it one time. So 
like I said, the best advice to give would be to stay in your own lane and mind your own business. Mine was, I would say, somebody overdosing. You feel me? People do all types of shit in there. You feel me? So my worst part was being in a room. You feel me? And somebody literally damn near dying on the floor. You feel me? And you're not knowing what to do. You feel me? So my immediate reaction was like, I want to get out this room because in there, if anything happens like that, you feel me? Everybody's going under. It don't matter. You feel me? So that could be the worst thing that I have experienced because I didn't want a, a, life, a 12 year sentence to turn to a life sentence on something that has nothing to do with me. Thank you. The last and final question, guys, would be the saddest thing that I've seen in prison. And the saddest thing that I've seen is after about three months of being on a yard, which is reception, you will then be transferred over the wall. And that is where the main yards and where people are permanently housed. So basically, that's where majority of the inmates are. So once I got over the wall and got in my unit, there was this young girl, I say she was about 18 years old. I'm not going to say no names, but we were in the trans packing room. And for you guys that don't know, that basically means we're not going to stay at that facility uh, permanently. We're going to be transferred somewhere else, maybe to a different prison, um, wherever that may be. But we're not staying at Chowchilla. So while we were in the trans packing room, there was this woman that basically had a life sentence to do at Chowchilla. And basically, the inmates run Chowchilla. So if they ask, if they have seniority and they ask basically can they be put in this room or whatever the case may be, the, the cops basically give it to them. So we had a lady who basically was doing a life sentence who came into the trans, moved into the trans packing room and basically came in there with some drugs. And the drug in particular would be crystal. And due to the fact that everybody in my room did crystal of some sort, everybody's uh, noses was open. They were ready. And, you know, in the free world, if somebody comes along that you know, your friend or whatever that has some particular drug, they're down to share it with everybody. But that's not how it goes in prison. So what happened was she came in that room with some drugs and she shared it with everyone. And this one young girl in particular had a very wealthy father. And her father was wealthy, which means due to the fact that his daughter was in prison, anytime she called and asked for something, he basically sent it right away. So what ended up happening is everybody who did those drugs that she brought into the room had to pay back whatever was drugs they did or pay her debt or pay for the drugs in some type of way. It was only me and one other older lady who didn't involve in any drugs while being incarcerated. So with that being said, she got used to the sense of doing the drug that she was doing while she was out in the free world. And the inmate ended up extorting her by basically having her call her dad and um, ask for money to pay off her debts and pay for more drugs. And it was just a sad situation because the girl was so young, very, very young and naive because a person of my age knew that that might not have been the best situation to get yourself involved in because you could smell trouble before it even walked in the door. And the fact that the lifer inmate started calling her dad and basically asking for money that we started giving the young girl advice as to try to give your dad a password so that when you call and you say this password, he knows it's you. And he knows it's not the inmate because the inmate was calling the dad saying the girl was in trouble and you know she was in fear for her life and that if he didn't send this X amount of money, something would happen to her. And basically that was the saddest thing I've seen because the young girl was so naive to the thought of doing drugs or doing the drug that she did in the free world that she was hip to get it more and more. And because she was hip to get it more and more, she allowed this lifer inmate to basically extort her. And it, it was sad because she was sad about it, but she was basically allowing it to happen for the need of the drug.
And I'm sitting here thinking like, you feel me? The saddest thing I could see was myself. You feel me? Going from being free and now I'm in prison. I was doing good at the beginning for like the first five years. And then after that, I start being a product of my environment. You feel me? So you feel me? I kind of just dragged myself in there. I didn't, I wasn't making it useful at all. You feel me? Cause I start seeing that feeling like, you feel me? This is it. You feel me? I'm not going to get out. This is my life. So I might as well just, you feel me? Deal with it. You feel me? So I really like drag myself down in the mud, put myself in a bunch of situations, having people back, didn't have minds, all different types of things in there. I got shanked in there for the first time and the person back I was having just stood there. So that taught me like a viable lesson. So I could say that's like the saddest thing for me. So guys, that concludes the first half of this video. Um, stay tuned because we will be answering questions and giving more insight into the trials and tribulations we face while being incarcerated at Central California Women's Facility, a.k.a. Chowchilla, the main women's prison of California besides CIW, which we'll get into later. So you guys stay tuned and thanks for watching.